Hello, everyone. We're going to start in about two minutes. Please come to the table. There's no reason you shouldn't sit up to the front if you'd like. You don't have to sit in the second row. So thank you very much for being here. This is workshop 391, a collaborative effort <laughs> between and among um, APC, the Internet Society, and the Seed Alliance. Um, many of us have been working on community networks for many years, and many of you in the room as well. So the baseline for this conversation is that community networks are a critical, important way to connect people. Um, we're not going to go through necessarily what they are and who's doing um, specific, specific um, things. Each of the organizations is going to give about 10 to 15 minutes. Sorry, you're pointing at something. To do what? Oh, sorry. Okay, there you go. Um, let me start over. I'm Jane from the Internet Society. This is panel 391. Uh, we are going to um, have three of the organizations here, the Internet Society, APC, and the Seed Alliance give um, you a snapshot of some of the work that we're doing, 10 to 15 minutes each. And then we're going to open it up um, to all of you for recommendations on how to move forward to help promote community networks. That can be anything from the technical, the policy, the regulatory, or the development side for funding and sustainability. So I'm going to start with APC, and there are three speakers from APC. We have Chat, Kathleen, and Carlos. They'll introduce themselves. We're going to go over to Sebastian from the Internet Society, and after that to the Seed Alliance, uh, to Carolina. So we're going to start with APC. Good afternoon. It's the hour where we're all very active and really attentive, right? <laughs> you, look, you seem so far away. But this is really going to be stories, yes? Um, so I will start by telling how we got, why is it that we're doing this work, uh, some history. Um, so, start, so, so community networks, access and connectivity is in APC's DNA. Um, we, when we first started, our members actually provided the first, if you like, you know, iteration of community networks. In the days when it was bulletin boards, it was email, and I, we have people here who actually set up the um, wires and cables at that time that connected our members in different parts of the world. So I think just to come back to that history, and, it, and that's, we were founded in 1990. Um, so 30 years on, there were different iterations of how we connect and how access, um, and especially coming from a community perspective or start, you know, starting from community, community perspective. So um, the, I think the one thing that, um, you know, through the years also, what's useful to, to look at is how the technology has changed and how we've used the technology, whatever is available at that time. So for example, at the time when the wireless connectivity um, came up, it is about connect using wireless technology to be able to maximize the connectivity. Um, and that has also, I remember, maybe it was in the early 90s, uh, or mid, mid 90s when we did work around wireless networks and um, experimented with wireless connections in different countries and also connected communities that were um, looking at connect connecting those communities. Um, I think the, the way we came up with community networks is because we've always, our, through our members and our partners, we've always been, um, we work in communities, so we, we actually have those kinds of connections. We understand what the local needs are. Um, and it is also adjusting to what the technology is. Um, we know that it's become much more 
it's cheaper, there are, more, um, there are more technologies that we can use, and it's also that um, we're able to make those connections with, com with other groups that are doing um, the same thing. So it, with regards to the community networks, we started um, this specific um, project around community networks four years ago. Three, three, four years ago where we had um, opportunity to talk to one of our partners and that's the um, IDRC um, to work with several um, community networks um, in different um, uh, to seed research around looking at uh, the social as well as gender, um, economic impact, or livelihoods on livelihoods of community networks. And through that, we've managed to really connect with different um, community networks, um, which um, that also has attracted resources, also from other donors that we have. And we are now continuing that work with peers who you've heard, some of you have heard this morning. So. Um, the other point I wanted to raise here is that it's the, the work in the community networks is also very connected to the work that we do around policy advocacy. So it's not just providing the connectivity, but it is in fact looking at influencing the um, policy environment. So, um, and supporting that so that it can actually continue to grow no? the, the, the the community, the, the growth of community networks in um, in the different regions where we work in. Um, we also, one of the other things that we make sure of is um, that there is a consistent um, perspective that is inclusive and specifically drawing on or making sure that there's a gender perspective and that that's from the start, because we've learned a lot of lessons in the past around connect connectivity, um, connectivity work or um, initiatives that really lives, that does not have a thoroughgoing digital inclusion uh, perspective. Um, and this is one of the things that we're making sure of in the work that we are doing now, which um, Carlos and Kathleen will be speaking about more. But I guess I, I will leave it there and let you explain more what we're doing. Thanks, uh, Chat. Uh, thanks so much for giving the 30-year uh, history of APC. And uh, it's true, really, a uh, connection um, from its early days of the green ISPs Really, the green eyes, please. <laughs> uh, my name is Kathleen Diga. I am a project coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communication. I'm based in Durban. Um, and uh, just building on uh, what Chat uh, spoke to, uh, in 2017, uh, we are building on research. As she mentioned, I think the last time I was put on stage was to uh, help coordinate the global uh, information um, uh, watch <laughs> society watch uh, uh, book 2008 on community networks many of the authors are here again so it's great to see a lot of familiar faces uh, you know the year later and really uh, again having the chance to uh, talk about the key achievements uh, by communities through this community uh, networks project uh, titled Co uh, Connecting the Unconnected. Really what uh, has been uh, spoken of was this uh, opportunity to have communities uh, exchange uh, lessons. So uh, what we were hearing from a lot of communities was that they were working in isolation and they wanted to learn how uh, community networks were run in other places. And, uh, you know, this uh, opportunity last year uh, had this chance for uh, communities to come together, meet with each other, learn from each other, improve their networks, gain new ideas, collaborate. Uh, we saw a lot of collaboration in, in Latin America. Um, 
in a national sense in, in India as well, uh, and in, in uh, between Kenya and Zimbabwe, and, and also look at that broader ICT ecosystem of regulation and gender intersectionality, uh, working in rural areas, in, in poor communities. So the peer learning exchange was one of the uh, ideas was to connect 12 community networks in the global south, in Asia, Latin America, and, and Africa. And, and really what has come out of this mutual respect and diversity of connecting each other were the, are these remarkable experiences uh, between communities that in, in their regions of understanding each other's uh, difficulties but successes, I was given the uh, story of, well, I think we've heard a few times, uh, well, at least the last session from Mama Sikau, just uh, you know, learning more about going to uh, Bosco, Uganda, and Gulu, um, and just being inspired by the community radio aspects and how they're connecting you know, schools that are working with refugees and just how she wants to bring it back to the Zenzeleni network. And, and also with uh, then the Ugandans going to visit Senzeleni and doing practical things like they were having issues with the solar uh, system. We had Solomon come in and just say, I, I'm a solar expert, let me show you what you, was, you just need to tweak. And then solution solved, just like that. So stories like that, just again, remarkable experiences that were coming out and collaborations that were not happening previous uh, were happening uh, through this peer exchange. Uh, besides that, we also have uh, Pathfinder. We worked with Rizomatica as a partner uh, through Pathfinder grant, where 11 catalytic interventions were funded to explore issues of sustainability and how to take just one step further to expand the reach and, and understanding of sustainability. And, and further to that was some technological development side, some software, some hardware um, exploration under the auspices of APC Labs. Um, and again, just having an opportunity to uh, see uh, you know, if you want to go and work uh, with women uh, in, a, in a network, or if you want to go and work with indigenous groups in the Amazon, what are some of those aspects uh, that are very, you know, contextualized that are, are needed in order uh, for this, this consideration of sustainability to, to really uh, come to effect? Um, and then uh, there was aspects of uh, movement building. We continue, I mean, aside from, you know, uniting or having a, a chance to uh, speak closely with community networks and have them speak across um, with each other is the launch of, well, ongoing uh, 23rd Community Networks newsletter and a Q&A platform, communitynetworks.group, to at least, you know, start some conversations to make public what's just being said in, you know, at close quarters. Let's talk about you know, uh, some of those technical issues that people are having in a, in a public forum so that people can learn from each other. Uh, and so, I mean, we, we're, it's still in its starting stages, 30 topics you know, in, in, for just since mid-2019. Then we, uh, I would say policy has been um, a partnership uh, that with uh, Internet Society has been quite successful through their regula regulation training uh, workshops with regulators in the global south. Uh, for example, working uh, in West Africa, uh, French speaking uh, area, which has been uh, a place that um, area uh, that we've been wanting to work with partners with, but didn't know where to start. And really what came out of these workshops is that Regulators just need more information. They just needed to understand what are the aspects that small operators uh, are struggling to get across around uh, the regulation that they need in order to thrive. And from that, uh, I believe uh, to date around over 100 uh, regulators have been trained from, I believe it was around about five or six workshops that have happened in the global south. Uh, and then finally, gender and, and women's engagement, if you were in the workshop prior to. It is the tireless work of women and gender non-conforming persons within the community, working from the technical to the social, that are, are, are making these communities thrive and know that 
their knowledge is the most important and we want to ensure that their knowledge is preserved and, and uh, utilized and that they have a network that means something to them. And uh, I mean, I would love to, you know, name and, and thank all the, you know, for this grant process, for the learning grant we had, um, purposely asked that at least one woman be involved and, and the, the 12 women that, uh, you know, we've united with, uh, all I can say is that Watch This Space Community Networks Women's Summit 2020 uh, is in the works. So I'll leave it at that and pass it to my colleague, uh, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. I, I, I want to be brief. I don't, I, um, this session was about taking a stock, reflecting a bit of the, 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 the trip, the, the, the journey that we started together, the three organizations at some point in the past about supporting the people who wanted to, to set up their own telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, not that long ago, in these spaces and in other policy and regulatory spaces, the only voices that were heard, the only way of creating and setting up and deploying telecommunications infrastructure was that of the private sector, was that of the market economy, was that of the highly invested companies uh, that were looking at telecommunications and uh, electronic communication service provision as a highly for-profit venture. Uh, most of the telecommunications companies in, in Africa have been among the top three, top five highest scorers in any um, stock market in, in, in the region. In the last at least four years that I've been involved at this more policy, uh, international policy level, uh, we've seen a, a, a big change. Uh, we've seen it this year. I mean, I remember in 2016 in Guadalajara, we were running around trying to get, in every session, uh, coordinating each other, trying to get the voice that of these people heard. I don't know how many sessions, I haven't counted them in this IGF, but <laughs> we don't even need to be there and, and, and the topic is discussed. Even this morning in the, in the dynamic coalition on, on innovative approaches to connecting the unconnected, uh, one of the reflections of, of uh, Professor Yu was, uh, I'm gonna, people didn't think they were possible, and now they are considering that the, at, the high at the highest level of policy. Tomorrow we will be talking about how uh, they are included in many policy documents and policy recommendations from the Broadband Commission to the African Union, to the to the UN Secretary's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Um, and it's not only about recognition, which I think is huge. It's, all, it's also about partnerships and about movement building. It's about sharing and trusting each other, learning from each other. There's a community of practice that is starting to believe that is possible. Again, and it's, it hasn't been that long ago. And, uh, and that's thanks to most of the activities that we are doing together, the three organizations. I'm sure we do things wrong, and that's why there is going to be 45 minutes for you to tell us how many things we've done wrong. But I, I, have, I have the feeling that uh, there has been many things that we've done right. And um, again, it's not only about the policy, it's not only about the, about the movement and the, and, the, and the sharing, it's also about the, the deepening. Um, I, I've ended up specializing in, in policy and regulation, and in the last summit on community networks in, in, in Africa, that was last month in Tanzania, there is this exercise Well, we've created another resource that is a policy wiki uh, where people can uh, co collaboratively contribute to see how a community network could fit in the regulatory framework of their particular country. From the licensing perspective, from the spectrum perspective, from the universal service and access fund, from the national policy, etc. Anyway, three years ago, four years ago, I believe two, community networks were legal, right? And everyone looking at regulation was like, what? no, no, this is the technology, is the social things, is, no, regulation is something else. But the exercise was like two hours or one hour and a half. After one hour and 45 minutes, the people were like 140 people were working on the policy week and we had to say, guys, we need to go for lunch. So there is a, there is a new energy around engaging in the deepest levels of policy and regulation in their own countries, which is the most boring thing ever. Uh, is, is about, you know, like also, I don't know how many, we were, we had to overcome. I, I remember the first discussions with IDRC at the, at CIF in uh, uh, 2017 and about 
tell me how this is going to be different from telecenters. We put a lot of money on the telecenter movement and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And how the sustainability models are, are coming up in a very solid way. How creative ideas, uh, out of the market ideas, uh, um, understanding that barter and other economies that don't follow market premises are also ways that can sustain and do sustain community networks. So, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I think we've, we've grown a lot, I'm sure. Uh, there are many challenges ahead of us. We can discuss them later. But uh, I think there is uh, quite a lot of exciting things that have happened. Thank you. And for those of you that just joined us, um, this is a, a stock taking, as Carlos has said, with APC, the Internet Society, and our colleagues from the Seed Alliance from LACNIC and from APNIC Foundation. Um, APC has just spoken about some of the history and what they're doing. My colleague Sebastian Belagamba is going to go next, and then we'll have the team from the Seed Alliance after. And then we'd actually like the feedback from all of you, because as Carlos has said, this is no longer a should they, can they work. They do work. Community networks are a thing. They're viable. We've been making change in policy and regulatory activity, and it's been amazing to watch what's happened since we were in 2016 in Guadalajara at the IGF, mm. where the momentum started to build, and all of a sudden everybody was talking about community networks. They're like, oh my gosh, it's a thing, it's real. It's not new, new, um, for sure, but there's new momentum and new change because we're seeing that people have been unconnected for, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and so something has to give, and we have to create new paradigms. So over to Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Belagamba. I'm the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Internet Society. Um, and I also, and on my free time, uh, my other part of my job, I also lead uh, our program on, on community networks for the past two years at the Internet Society as well. This being, and this is about taking stock and discussing with you because I, I, I cannot agree more with, with uh, what Carlos said and, and Jen has said. It is amazing. We've been working on, on, on community networks for more than 10 years at the Internet Society. The last three years, uh, I've been involved more uh, personally. And it's amazing the momentum that has been created. Things happen I, without you knowing and without you making anything to happen. There is a lot of uh, butterfly effect now uh, going on around community networks. And that's something we need to um, take uh, advantage of. And because once you have momentum, you, uh, the momentum doesn't last forever. So it's your time to act. And there is an urgency on this, I mean, on, on acting. And I would like to reflect a bit on, on that. I think there is a, an urgency because we have the momentum now, we didn't have the momentum before, and we are not guaranteed to have the momentum tomorrow. So today is the day. But most importantly, one thing that I've learned when, when I got involved with the, with the community networks is that I had misunderstood the concept of the digital divide. We at the Internet Society, one of the things that we promote the most is connectivity for people. We, the Internet is for everyone, and we need to connect the rest of the world that is not connected. Now the 47% of the world, according to last month's figures by ITU, the 47% of the world that is not yet connected to the Internet. That's a, a priority for us. We want to have a bigger and stronger Internet. Um, but as I said just now, the digital divide, in my mind, used to be that difference between the... F the, the uh, 53% uh, that is connected versus the 47% that is not connected. And I came to understand that actually the digital divide is different. It's the gap that you have that separates the 53% from the 47%. And that gap, even though we keep connecting people and the Two, uh, one year ago was 51.49, this year is 53.47, uh, uh, the, the, the connected people in the world. The gap that separates those that are connected, that those that are not yet connected, keeps widening every single day. And that's, that's um, a, a byproduct of our own success. 
because I would say that the, the real life used to be offline. Real life now happens online. I live in Uruguay. In Uruguay, today, if you need to renew your driver's license, you have to go online in order to do it. So basically, if you are one of the 47% that are not yet connected to the internet, you will struggle to renew your driver's, li uh, driver's license. In that sense, I mean, and the driver's license is a basic, I mean, day-to-day -day example. Uh, the important thing is that we are leaving behind every day that we move online and uh, to those that are not, uh, those that, that are not connected. So we need to act on, on this because we have momentum, but we need to act now because if we don't do it, we are leaving people behind all, all the time. And I think that's critical. We have been working a lot. Uh, I, I totally would like to, to, to uh, uh, agree on the importance of the, of the partnerships on this. We have been including and expanding our partnership and people that is willing to work, to work to, uh, together. We just finished um, a training of 150 reg uh, regulators with CITEL, which is the, uh, the, tele the, tele the Inter-American Telecommunications Commission. Uh, part of the Inter-American uh, the Inter-American uh, Organization, the uh, Organization of American States, um, and they are asking us to to run the, the program again next year. It's part of the momentum that we're, we're talking about, but it's also that everyone is now considering a, a, a community networks as a valid as a valid possibility. And that's something we, we, we need to, to, to take advantage of. What do we need to do in, in order to... So we keep getting friends, people that some of them are partners, some of them are friends, some of, of them are people that are not that convinced, but they're giving a chance to this. It all counts. It all is important. So. What, what, in my mind, should be our focus? And what would be, uh, what, what was and what, what should be our approach from the Internet Society, at least on, on trying to address this, uh, this, this issue? Let me check how much time. Okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think that there are four important components that we need to address for, for the future, and challenges and opportunities that we need to, to address for the future. The first one, is we need to continue deploying community networks, supporting the deployment of community networks. That's, that's critical because, um, let me give you an example for, from, for Latin America, that, the region I, I know the most. And, and community networks, before that, community networks is one way to address the, the connectivity gap, okay? It's not the ultimate solution. It's not, we are not going to connect the 47% that is, that is there with community networks. It's one and it's important. It's an important one because it's, it's addressing, as my colleagues have said, an important uh, layer of, 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 of those that are not yet connected. We need to, and, and, but it's important to understand the magnitude of the problem that we're facing. Because sometimes we think that those people that, are, uh, that we are addressing are marginal in some, in some way. It's, it's a small, group of people that lives in, in, in rural areas that obviously deserve to be connected, but it's a, it's a, a residual part of, of the population that we need to connect. And that is not true. And that is not true. In Latin America, according to GSMA, 84% of the population, not the territory, the population is covered by 2G or more. Let's assume for a minute that 2G means internet, okay? Um, Eight, that's that's a, a really great number. I mean, it's, it's a really important number. 84% of the population lives in, a, in an area of coverage. Good. But still, 16% lives in an area that, is, that, that there is no coverage at all. No, not even 2G. We have like more than 600 million inhabitants in Latin America. So 16% of 600 million plus is 100 million people. It's not marginal. The potential market of this 
is 100 million people just in Latin America. So let's focus, focus on that. What, what would be our, our, our focus and what we are, we are meant to do uh, next year and, and beyond? First, deploy. Let's support deployments of community networks worldwide. Uh, we need to lead by example. May, uh, as my colleague has said, it works, it's sustainable, it's not the, the telecenters. Uh, this works, it's ownership from the community. Um, the community runs the, the, the networks and they make it happen. It's been proven, it's running, uh, and it works. A second one, we need to create the capacities for, for that to happen. Uh, those communities are remote communities. They do not have the capacities in, 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 in their places. So we need to help them. And that's a way to support it. The third one, and I think it's a critical one that's, that's been mentioned, is we need to create an enabling policy environment for them to thrive. And that's critical, and I, and I think it is a, a component of critical importance here at the, at the IGF. First, we need licenses for these community networks. We want them to operate legally. We don't want anyone to go to jail for running a, a community network. Uh, so we need to recognize the existence of community networks and make it legal through a licensing scheme. But a licensing scheme that must be different in some, in some ways from the big operators, because yeah, you're not going to subject these small networks that are uh, in, in, in remote areas to the same conditions as the, uh, as the big guys. That doesn't mean that they have to have different competitive advantages versus the, the, the operators. They are, they are operating in a different environment, and we need to recognize that they're operating in a, different, uh, in a different environment. Second one, it is impossible that we will try to connect these community networks with fiber to the home. They're by itself uh, located in remote areas and in, in general, they're composed of dispersed population. So we need to cover them with some kind of wireless technology. Good technology for, for do that general coincides with the spectrum that, that is being allocated to, to the big operators. Let's find innovative ways to have secondary uses of a, of, of a spectrum, a shared spectrum. Let's, let's think ways that, that we, can, we can use the spectrum that is being allocated to, to, to someone in, in our countries, but is not being used in that particular geographic region. Let's use it somehow, I mean, without damaging anyone's interest, but let's use it. I mean, it's not being used, and we need it. And third, and this comes attached to the, to the licensing scheme, let's try to come up with a way in order to help them. I think the most important part of the financial help that a community network needs is the capex more than the opex. I mean, the, the, the first investment, equipment, etc. So let's try to help them. And our governments have a tool that is designed to, to do that, which is generally called the Universal Service Funds. Universal Service Funds have been designed to subsidize communications for people that live in remote areas where the market is not going. So let's use it for that, okay? In general, the three things are intertwined. They cannot apply to a, a universal service fund because they don't have a license. And the universal service fund is only available to licensees, and so on. So let's try to sort it out, I mean, the three at the, at the, uh, at the same time somehow. There's been many countries that have already uh, made uh, 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 advancements on, on this. So there are examples. It can work. It can work without hurting anyone. We are just trying to... Um, this is a cooperative uh, approach. Let's complement the efforts that the private sector and the governments are doing in, 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 other, in, other, in other areas. Let's complement that with connecting these people that, that live in remote areas that make no economic sense for, for private operators to go there because there is no business. And it's right. Companies are not there to lose money. Companies are there to, to, to make money, and that's fine. 
but we, ne we need to do something with the people that live in an area that is not profitable enough for a company to deploy a network. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. So we're going to head over to the Seed Alliance next. And after that, we'll have an open session. We'd love your feedback and some recommendations on the policy side. And I forgot to mention, we're going to stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. And there's going to be a special presentation of the Seed Alliance Awards. So it'll be a festive ending of the session. So um, over to the team from the Seed Alliance. Thank you, Jane. Um, Carolina and I, we are going to share these few minutes uh, about the Seed Alliance work. Uh, my name is Silvia Cadena. I'm head of programs of the APNIC Foundation. Um, APNIC is one of the five RARs, the regional internet registries. We allocate the IP addresses for network operators to connect uh, their customers to the internet. And um, they are the large operators that Carlos was referring to that are the incumbent in many countries and uh, that uh, are deploying uh, networks mo mostly to urban centers. And uh, they are, we are also finding a way where this ecosystem of uh, different business models that can coexist to provide access can uh, also mean that IP addresses need to be allocated in a different way to organizations that are registered in a different uh, fashion. So my, my bit, first bit of this presentation is about the history, a little bit of taking stock again about the Seed Alliance, um, and it's how intertwined it is to or the Internet Society and also to, to APC, and also to the place we are at the moment, to the IGF. The first meeting to talk about the Seed Alliance was actually at the IGF in Nairobi in 2010. Uh, where we dis discussed uh, with IDRC and the Internet Society how uh, we could put a little bit of the money into uh, this idea about finding new uh, alternatives to provide uh, access and innovation on Internet uh, technologies uh, across the Global South. So the Seed Alliance is a partnership between the AFRENIC, uh, which is the, the Regional Internet uh, Registry for Africa, uh, APNIC in Asia Pacific, and LACNIC in Latin America. And we've been um, a project operating uh, since 2012. Um, so far, we have supported uh, over 180 projects and allocated over $5 million to projects that are related to digital innovation uh, in the across the Global South. And we very proudly uh, support the community networks uh, activists and, and practitioners uh, from the very uh, early beginning. Uh, part of the things that I think is uh, more relevant about the Seed Alliance interventions here is to kind of take on a little bit of the risk that other donors were not that interested to have their logo attached to um, for some of the reasons that my, my colleagues here uh, mentioned uh, before. Uh, just because back then it was not that clear that it was going to work, right? So it has uh, different flavors, uh, how community access is sorted or provided in different regions. And there are lots of examples on our, uh, on the Sea Alliance website uh, and of course in each one of the of the regional uh, programs, FRIDA for Latin America, FIRE uh, from Africa, and the Easy Asia uh, program in, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, but we have supported uh, projects in Thailand, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Myanmar, Micronesia, Timor-Leste, Nue, Vanuatu, Vietnam, um, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Kenya, uh, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and a lot. So we are keep, it's, it's in not, they are not apples and oranges. It's impossible to compare. They have crazy innovations in each one of those pa uh, places where they are working. Um, really amazing cultural uh, um, richness uh, that, that makes them unique in themselves. But as the idea of looking for scale and opportunities to bring access to the unconnected uh, comes in. These mechanisms of funding mechanisms to support this kind of innovations like the Sea Alliance has done, uh, I think are, are very important. And in a few years ago, which, IG, which IGF I can't remember, but we did, we did one workshop at the IGF talking about a um, uh, few years ago about innovation in how you support devices, networks, and content, and you put money to make sure that that is all local. So just imagine in a world where we have devices like the Libre Router that the Sea Alliance collectively support um, during the, a few years ago. Um, 
content develop, developed uh, for the communities that means local services are in their local languages? And what, what will be the world if we have devices that are fit for purpose and culturally appropriate and that are serving uh, local content and local community needs and that are owned by the very local people that need them and not necessarily building the pockets of uh, companies that are from uh, other places. So I think that, that there is space in this, in this uh, session in this, this taking stock about just, of course, there is lots of work to be done. Uh, uh, we haven't achieved everything that we wanted uh, to achieve and uh, the funding that we have been able to provide is uh, small grants. So, of course, the millions that are required to make this uh, more effective, probably we don't have them. But we keep advocating for uh, a building a collaboration also on the funding part, so that access to funding for those that need support is something uh, that is easier uh, spread and, uh, and uh, different donors can contribute to the little bits and pieces that they are more uh, interested in. And that's what the, the role of the Sea Alliance in the past few years, since 2012 until this year. Um, so we, we encourage you to visit the website, to look at the projects that we have supported, to get in contact with each one of the regions to see what's available for each one of the regions, but also to spread the word that, that it's not only about what technical innovation is out there, what, can, what the, each of the projects and the richness of the projects is, but it's also about how we can fund them and how can we help them grow. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia, for um, that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in this exercise, um, to sort of take stock of what has been done by the Seed Alliance, um, we, we did this exercise this morning, actually, <laughs> of um, identifying uh, successes or things that we feel have gone right and uh, some challenges that we understand that lie ahead. And we'd like to share with you uh, two, two uh, successes, if you will, and uh, one challenge uh, that we feel uh, sort of uh, lies ahead. Um, so, uh, again, discussing this morning and uh, with Sylvia and preparing for this panel, one of the things that we feel has uh, worked well um, in our efforts to uh, support community networks is the funding uh, mechanisms um, provided by, by the Alliance um, and sort of the gap that we tried um, to fill in terms of um, what funding opportunities were available to community networks across our three regions of work. Um, so Sylvia has alluded to this a little bit, but I'll go into sort of further details. So Seed Alliance uh, works primarily um, uh, through two types of uh, funding mechanisms. We have awards uh, on the one hand, and then we have small uh, innovation grants. Um, and starting with the community networks um, awards that we, uh, we have been uh, giving um, out in, in the last couple of years, um, these have sort of allowed us to give visibility to some of the success uh, cases and organizations that uh, essentially proved that, that community networks were indeed a feasible uh, solution to, to the challenge of connecting the unconnected. Um, and our awards involve um, a small cash contribution to winning projects, uh, but, I, but perhaps the, the most uh, sort of significant or important contribution uh, to these initi initiatives that we supported um, has been our travel fellowships to um, uh, different spaces such as the Internet Governance Forum. So one example I always like to cite um, is uh, the colleagues from Alter Mundi, uh, which received the Frida Award in uh, 2015, so before the Guadalajara IGF when things sort of started to uh, take off and um, you know we believe that participating in this IGF allowed them to sort of better integrate and um, and develop uh, connections in, in the internet governance world. And we have some colleagues from Alter Mundi here, maybe they can attest or, or not to, to what I'm saying. Um, the um, other funding mechanism which we utilize are small innovation grants. Um, and this come in sort of various forms and shapes. Um, we support projects that are, are getting started and also projects that are looking to scale up, essentially. But generally speaking, what we uh, sort of try to focus on as Seed Alliance uh, is supporting innovations that will be considered, as Sylvia said before, too risky for uh, sort of regular investors, be it uh, philanthropic investors or private investors. And we sort of work to push those uh, ideas past proof of concept or those solutions, you know, help those solutions scale. Um, and again, here in, in terms of our community, uh, well, our work with community networks, I think this grant support of, you know, that has very sort of uh, high tolerance, if you will, to, to risk has been useful. 
Um, and one great example is the seed capital that we provided uh, for the Libre Router project, which many of you um, uh, do know, uh, which was essentially a project that sought to develop a, a router that was better suited for, for the needs of community networks, uh, relying on open uh, uh, source software and hardware. Um, so I think, again, in that regard, and to sort of wrap up that um, the City Alliance has um, managed to support the community networks in, again, helping them gain greater visibility, especially at this sort of early stage before they became something that, that, that was uh, hot and in fashion. Um, and most importantly, supporting them in innovating, testing, and sort of learning by trial and error. Um, beyond that, another point where at last I would say we worked uh, hard on uh, is um, adjusting our grant making to sort of the evolving needs of the community networks movement. Um, so with all the work that's sort of transpired over the last couple of years, I think as Jane said earlier, um, you know, we know that community networks are sort of well past, you know, proof of concept. They work. Um, and uh, essentially the work has started sort of shifting to more specific uh, agendas that have to do with uh, finding and exploring different sustainability models uh, that have to do with uh, pushing to have enabling regulation as uh, Sebastian was mentioning as well. Um, and promoting local content and so forth. So here, Sylvia and I would like to provide one example of how our programs have supported these new agendas. I'll start off and then we, we go to you, um, if that's okay. So in the case of Frida in 2018, um, we supported two initiatives, one by Article 19 in Brazil, and we have Rafaela he here in the room, um, and one by Colnodo uh, in Colombia, and I think Julian Casanueva is here as well. Yeah, there he is. Um, so please feel free to, to jump in. Um, so essentially, um, uh, these two projects that we supported uh, proposed to create um, three new networks in, in these two countries. And to us, that was an opportunity to understand what it takes to scale up community networks. Sebastian was referring just now to the fact that we need to continue deploying uh, community networks. And we have some communities where um, these networks have sort of emerged uh, organically. But the big question is uh, that's sort of floating around is how do we get the solution to take root in communities that are uh, seeking to go online, that are uh, seeking to rely on, on technology perhaps to improve their access to communication and content, even if, if in some cases they don't quite connect to the internet. Uh, so in this regard, again, these two organizations, uh, uh, Articulo 19 and uh, Colnodo, supported community processes uh, leading to the creation of three networks, uh, two in northeast Brazil, if a geography doesn't fail me, and um, one in rural Colombia. Um, and we felt these were very interesting cases where these organizations essentially paired uh, local communities with uh, technical teams and successfully uh, worked on the setup of networks and also on sort of uh, facilitating community debates and trainings along with the creation uh, of these networks. Um, another important or interesting thing we saw um, um, that while the sort of setup of local networks is feasible uh, in the short term, the, the projects that we fund normally last uh, around 12 months, getting the community to sort of coordinate the sustainability model to pay for the internet links uh, require normally more time and uh, maybe it's sort of a more challenging aspect. Um, and as a matter of fact, we had a, a network in Brazil out of the two that got set up uh, that sort of before uh, the community before going online, they wanted to continue using the network that was set up locally to achieve sort of uh, greater uh, appropriation of the technology and, and work on generating local content. So we had some interesting dynamics come up such as uh, this one and maybe Rafaela can speak to that uh, later on in the discussion. Um, and lastly, in all three cases, we saw um, that there was the creation of coordination committees that were sort of crucial um, to ensure like the actual sort of appropriation of these networks that were set up and uh, to sort of formalize the organizational structure and sustainability models uh, of the networks, which you know, we, we see is sort of coming up also as a, a sort of element in these exercises of uh, scaling community networks. Um, so um, we are, um, yeah, trying to sort of continue to support the, the community networks uh, movement in these new challenges that are coming up. And I'll ask uh, Sylvia maybe to say a few words about ACIF's support around uh, power networks, actually. Thank you. 
And I look at Jane in case of the time, but you yell and bell a ring or whatever. I will shut up. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in terms of um, the, the ESIF examples, well, as I mentioned, there are plenty and they are all on our website. You can check the reports and I can put you in contact with the people that we have supported. But I just want to uh, highlight the experience of one that uh, is very dear to us. It's one of our first rank recipients uh, from uh, 2009. That is the, the wireless provider for the Dalai Lama, so you can't be cooler than that. And then, sorry for anyone else. <laughs> um, and then they have grown into actually an enterprise that provides access in India uh, for nine cities and has hundreds and thousands of users, uh, provide access to banks, schools, hospitals, and become a, an employer, a formal employer, and it's one of what we call uh, success uh, cases, let's say. They are doing a research uh, project this year around power and telemetry, trying to figure out how to maintain alive the, the relay stations out there in the mountains in India where they are interconnecting uh, cities and uh, different schools and hospitals. And they, their project is about how they can ensure that a specific relay can stay up for a particular number of hours, um, but it's all uh, with uh, an open source uh, software that is developed by them, monitored by the community, and that it also will have that human element of not having people going up and down the mountain to check on equipment when it's not needed, uh, which also helps uh, the staff that is maintaining those relays, uh, which in the mountains of the Himalayas has a whole different meaning when you're saying, I'm going up the mountain, right? So that's one. So I, I think that the, they are, you know, as I mentioned, they have moved from a small pro, uh, a community provider into something bigger, but they are still facing challenges that no one else is listening. And this power challenge was one that we heard, and we put the funding from the ESIF program for, for uh, this year into two grants uh, on, on power for internet access. So there are other challenges, and we next year when we launch in February our next uh, internet for development grants, we'll focus probably on another connection between access and something else. We'll, we'll try to see how uh, that these small grants help to just bring more visibility, as Carolina mentioned, to issues that other donors might be interested in. And uh, that's where we see our role. We don't have the, the whole capital to solve the problem, but we can definitely see how these examples and these proof of concepts uh, support um, that development. And in that uh, spirit, I just also wanted to share the, the on that challenge of sustainability, we're also exploring with some very dear uh, colleagues of us uh, from Connectivity Capital, uh, Jim Forster and his team in the US, uh, is a person that uh, was a former engineer at Cisco, uh, and full believer of community access and how um, access can only be provided if there is a vibrant market that operates different kinds of business models where they, everybody can coexist. But he's also a believer in scale. So what he's offering now are uh, soft loans for networks that have different shapes and forms, and it could be a community network that has a particular uh, amount of revenue and has some sort of stability, and he can lend from 250 to $2 million to support the scale of those networks. And that is kind of pushing a little bit the envelope for banks and other investors to look at this as a serious opportunity to, for growth, because this, the networks of volunteers um, you know, are great, but operating the internet from nine to five so someone else can go to bed or have a holiday sometimes doesn't work, especially in the expectation of how the internet should be running uh, these days. So this is this challenge is about exploring mechanisms where finance can support, where there is a technology that can assist in new and further improvements can only be done, in my opinion, when there is collaboration with organizations that are actually seeing the bigger picture. We don't work on regulation. It's great that ISOC is supporting that effort. We don't have uh, grassroots uh, movements to support. It's great that APC is taking that 
that lead, but we have a connection with the ISPs and the network operators, and we want to build that, uh, put a little bit that wall down. We have some of those great regulators from the Pacific that I'm looking across to Dalsi here in the room, for example, that are deploying these ideas in different contexts. So I, I think that just trying to look at this without fear, as, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, not fear, that, that was not the word that you used, but I mean fear of the um, using without harm, harming anyone, sort of thing that you mentioned, is really important. You know, it can only be done when you have different organizations look at different parts of that pie, right? And it's a shared responsibility to see how it is that we are going to achieve uh, stable, open, and reliable access, and accessible access for those that don't have it now to can participate effectively in what it is the world today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so we've heard from um, the team here, um, different pieces of the stock taking, some of what we've done, some of the great policy regulatory challenges we have in front of us, funding mechanisms. And now we'd like to hear from you. Um, the theme that we had put together was the stock taking, but also what the policy questions might be, but also what some of the solutions and recommendations are moving forward. So we know that there are a lot of CNs around the room. There are others who are very interested. There may be more policymaker, uh, policymakers, regulators, and funders. I'm going to quickly read some of the questions that we had asked ourselves when we put this together, so to give you some food for thought. But um, get ready. In about two minutes, we'll be running through this. Um, we, when we put this together, we were looking at you know what factors should be considered when choosing community networks as a complementary way to connect the unconnected. And as Sebastian had said, we're looking at complementary. We're not trying to be an aggressive challenge to some of the uh, traditional operators because that's not the way the partnership might actually move forward in a productive way because we don't want them going to the regulator and the policymaker saying, don't let these little guys in because we can do this together. Um, how can policymakers and governments work with underserved rural remote indig indigenous areas to empower them to create their own connectivity solutions, i.e. community networks or small local networks? What needs to be done to reduce or eliminate barriers to community network deployment? Sebastian mentioned that earlier. It's a big thing for all of us here on deploying the networks. And what can we do either in legislation, administrative, or regulatory environments? How can different approaches to spectrum usage and innovative licensing help spread and support these models? How can we promote a multi-stakeholder approach for building up these networks? And what role can other stakeholders play to empower these communities to build, own, and operate their own connectivity solutions? So for those of you around the table that are running community networks or supporting them, we'd love your feedback. So who wants to go first? Because these are recommendations we want to take forward collectively to gather others. Um, and some of you may have some new innovative uh, solutions that we haven't uh, factored in. So if you don't raise your hand, I might call on you. <laughs> you so uh, there we are. All right, excellent. So um, yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Abdi Karim. I want to start by first of all thanking the panelists. I think you guys have done a wonderful job. And I especially want to thank the Internet Society for the wonderful job you guys have been doing on um, community networks around the world, and especially in Africa. I, however, I, I totally agree with the fact that we've gone a long way. It's not about community networks. Is it going to work? It's working. However, we've been seeing some of the what we've been seeing in recent time, and it's been going on for some time, is the active commercialization of the critical infrastructures of the internet. And a lot of this is being, uh, a lot of what we do in trying to provide the community networks have been eroded. And some arguments I've been seeing, especially from partners in the last few days, is giving me some fears to see that are we totally committed to this, um, to this commitment of connecting the entire world to the internet. And I want us to, it's been a fear to me because I just think some of the work we are doing, especially in this community, I just hope it's not gonna be eroded. And especially with the commercialization we've been saying now, with the arguments we're saying about this, and going to um, sharing experience, I want to say one of the challenges we have been having with Community Network is the fact that cost is one of the things. 
and especially when it comes to creating community networks in areas that are seen as urban areas. It's been a challenge to us because the regulators are saying, you cannot create this network in an urban area, you cannot create competition. And the aim is not to create competition, but actually to drive down, because as Carlos mentioned, some of these um, service providers, they are quite rich, and some of these prices are artificial prices that could actually be, can actually be reduced if you have some of this competition. But just like Jane mentioned, we are not trying to create competition with these ISPs, but at the same time, there has to be the drive within the community. There has to be um, the commitment or to see that these things are working. And this is one of the challenges I want to share and also my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, there are some very viable um, community networks in urban areas. One of them is New York City Mesh. Um, take a look. Um, they are a Wi-Fi based uh, with some microwave links. They're using unlicensed spectrum. Um, they're very, very, uh, they're rolling out lots of different nodes right now. And they have a great agreement with DKIX, which is an IXP in New York City, it's a German IXP, um, for backhaul. So they've really got an excellent um, model worked out. Um, I'm going to stop there. Who else? Lots of hands had gone up before. So Matt, I'm going to pick Matt Rantanen next, and then there's someone hiding behind that pillar. Oh, it's Duncan. Yeah. Okay, so Matt, you're up. And so, if you can give us recommendations that we can put forward, we'll, we're taking sure. notes here as you speak. Matt Rantanen, Director of Technology, Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, and 50 other things. <clears throat> um, I would like to suggest that we move forward in collaborating on an international community wireless summit, community network summit that uh, we used to run them back in the day with um, those of you who know Sasha Meinrath and the people out of Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, um, partnered with people in Vienna and people in Berlin, and appropriate that we're in Berlin. Um, it's an opportunity for people that want to build networks and people that do build networks to get together, to share some of the trade secrets and the things on the ground. Uh, this is already happening in an ISOC community, the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. Uh, we've done the third annual, we just finished in Hawaii, and um, it's an amazing opportunity. So the tribal groups that are getting together, that are learning how to build networks, would very much benefit um, getting together with those other community networks and wireless networks that are around the world uh, that have been doing it much longer and in different scenarios. And it, it's an opportunity to get this community to grow and then we need to develop some sort of um, platform or resource where we're all communicating. I know there are parts of those and they're fragmented, right? I would like to get something that is more centralized where a Southern California tribe can talk to a network in Georgia. I can already do that, I know Usha, but you know, a, a, a situation like that where we have an extreme to another extreme and it may be very beneficial because the Georgian mountains might be exactly like the mountains that are in Colorado at the Southern Ute tribe and the Southern Ute tribe is interested in building a network and they want to pick Ucha's brain and figure out, hey, does this work? What, you know, how did you get that up there? Oh, it was a military helicopter? That's pretty cool. You know, those kind of things. But it just needs to, ha we just need that community, that sense of community again and we would like to rally around an event uh, that doesn't exist anymore. So that's my two cents at the moment. Okay, point taken. Duncan. Thanks, Jane. Um, earlier this year, I joined Carlos uh, and uh, I saw at an event in Bangkok, uh, an excellent event, oh, and chat as well, and organized by APC around a UN SCAP event on the Asian Information Superhighway as it's called, quite a large initiative run by UNSCAP and community networks. We had a day on community networks. One of the things I found in talking to the government representatives who come along, because it's a UN event, um, was they, community networks was new to many of them and, and this idea of the regulatory environment, and maybe this has been done previously by the community, so please excuse me if I, I've not seen this, but they, they would ask about so what regulations do I need to have in place to make my economy conducive and welcoming to community networks? Can you give me a list? 
And which leads me to suggest or have the question, has the community thought of um, ranking countries in terms of how conducive and welcoming they are to community networks? To say, for example, Thailand is the most welcoming country to community networks. Lists, as I'm sure everyone knows, can be quite powerful things. They can be quite competitive in, in the Asia Pacific to find that I'm the most conducive country for community networks. And I can see from the work that's been done, a lot of it's been done already, um, that would allow the community to say, these are the economies that have the best regulatory environments. Um, and certainly I think it would be useful in the, in the Asia Pacific. Thanks. Thank you for that. And I could hear Carlos say the wiki. There's some good solutions that APC is building out, and I know that this has been a topic of conversation um, with our colleague Machuki, I think, and Carlos. Machuki is one of our ISOC staff who's uh, helped partner with APC and Carlos to do the African Summit, which was in its fourth year this year. But I think thank you for that, Duncan, because in Asia Pacific, I was in Singapore last week, and we had three different networks come in from the Philippines and Indonesia and Thailand, and there are a lot of different um, aspects of this that we can bring together from a commonality of what looks, what I hate this expression, what good looks like, but you know, what is conducive to support a community network? What's that environment? Because it's gonna be different from country to country. Um, okay, who else? I see Nico in the back, Don, um, Vasilis, so, and uh, Julian, so let's, and Ucha. So let's start with Nico, and we'll come up the row here. So Nico, Julian, Don, Vasil uh, Vasilis, Don, and Ucha. So go ahead, Nico, you're up. Hi. Um, I, well, I have uh, two hats, so I'm part of the Association for Productive Communications, but uh, Silvia and Carolina were mentioning also that I'm part of Alter Mundi. Thank you for raising that up. And uh, I actually wanted to say that it's a very, like from uh, my uh, grassroots uh, deploying community networks hat, it's amazing to have uh, a good bunch of the, those that are supporting, uh, actively supporting, and for many years, uh, the community networks movement. But uh, I must say that it's a task that is bigger than us all. Uh, so it's more like uh, my, my my comment is more about the 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 way forward uh, needs to have more of us, not just the ones that are there, not just those that are supporting those that are there. That's amazing that ISOC, IPC, Seed Alliance, and Frida and the rest have supporters that allow them to be doing what they are doing, but also needs more of us because we will not get to. 2030 with plenty of connectivity for everyone with just a bunch of us uh, doing this. So I guess uh, my, my wish for the following upcoming years is uh, getting to work with uh, governments, universal service funds uh, resources to unlock them and uh, getting them to work with their own communities in investing in community networks. Uh, um, and uh, allowing those that are, have been forgotten by our governments and our uh, markets to also have the chance to be connected. Thank you. Um, Julian? Thank you very much. Julian Casas Buenas, uh, director of uh, Colnodo, uh, uh, non for profit organization working in Colombia that uh, we have been uh, supporting community networks uh, with a couple of projects. Um, in the uh, last years, and um, my recommendations will be uh, based on on the experiences that uh, we have, and has to uh, do with um, uh, access to to the internet, uh, a good access. We have been trying to connect, uh, as Sebastian says. Uh, uh, these uh, networks in rural areas to the nearest uh, fiber optic um, uh, connection to guarantee uh, high speed so uh, communities can really get all the benefit uh, from a, a good connection. And we face different situations. Uh, we have two community networks recently that we connect to the fiber uh, that is uh, located in municipalities. And those that are more isolated, we have to pay more to get connected to that fiber. 
uh, and that's uh, in Buenos Aires, Cauca, in the southern part of the country, and the other one is in Mani, Casanare, in the valleys in, um, in the east part of the country where there are more infrastructure and there is cheaper to get connected. But still we have to pay like 19% of taxes for that connection. So that increases uh, much more the, the, the prices. And it seems that those that are not well connected have to pay more. Mm -hmm. So we have to change that and, and uh, work with governments and regulators to see how can we reduce these uh, costs of high-speed internet in rural areas. Another point is uh, that we are dealing with right now in Colombia is the legal definition of community networks. It's important that uh, there is a definition. What is a community network? It's for a non-for-profit operated by the community uh, to uh, operate their own infrastructure and so on. So in that way, we will be able, for instance, to better access to the universal communication funds. Because in Colombia, uh, since we don't have that definition, then um, it's, uh, I think that we will have to work harder uh, with the, uh, um, uh, all uh, um, stakeholders to, to, to get, uh, for instance, access to those funds that uh, must be part of them uh, uh, given to, to this kind of uh, um, initiatives. Um, for us has been very important the support of other groups. Uh, Rizomatica from Mexico, it's a, an example. All uh, colleagues from APC uh, through the projects that uh, has been funded, uh, the Lognet project and so on. So uh, it's important that uh, uh, donors and other interested uh, keep uh, supporting this kind of initiatives and exchanges and uh, that uh, has been for us uh, very important for the not to n not to make the same mistakes and, and to better implement uh, 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 this kind of um, initiatives and uh, finally um, I will say that it will be important also to have some resources to evaluate the social impact of these kind of projects, not only in terms of um, uh, revenues or return of investment, but in uh, social impact. Uh, we believe that uh, the amount uh, or the, the, the level of impact of these kind of uh, projects in the communities are very high, but we need to know uh, um, with a, a, a good a, work, a good way, uh, how the, this impact is and uh, and what's uh, the benefits from this kind of uh, uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got about ten more minutes, and we have at least uh, three other speakers. Was there anyone else who wanted to say something? Because I have Vasilistan Ucha. Was anyone in the back? Okay, in the, I don't even know your name, but we'll come to you in a sec. Okay, well, why don't we start with you, and then I'll go with it to the other guys. So if you have about a minute, if you could go quickly. <laughs> uh, so I'm Sharbani from Grammark. Uh, we work in the community networks in rural, remote villages of, uh, uh, away from Mumbai, uh, unconnected villages. Uh, my question or my recommendation would be that at what uh, at what point of time should we uh, should we take this into the policy domain? Like in the sense that in India currently there is uh, no policy on community networks, and uh, we would like to do that. Uh, we sh we should we want to begin, and uh, we are not even. Uh, uh, not even wanting to compete with the telecom operators and the others, uh, but eventually the telecom operators or the government project that is the Bharat Net is not even going into the locations where we are at least going in. So that brings us to the challenge, the next challenge, and that is the, the challenge of even though we set up community networks by the, I mean, seed the growth of community networks in the remote locations, but what eventually happens is that there is no one to take the bandwidth. 
Um, so the unconnected, even though we want to connect them and they have the aspiration to connect themselves by seeding the growth of community networks, they eventually cannot um, connect themselves. So we found out a solution now that we put up cellular SIM card based cellular router and just uh, sort of enhance the signals at one point at one particular location. So that at least the e-governance services and the and the banking facilities can be enabled in the village. So I think that is something we would like to recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Vasilis. Yeah, I, um, I would like to comment about, uh, on the um, on the issue of complementarity. Um, I'm Vasilis from Sarantaporo.gr, a Greek community network. I'm very happy to share with you that we have been uh, uh, promo uh, pro proposed as finalist for European Broadband Award, uh, um, which is, um, uh, yeah, um, we have been uh, proposed at the category that is called demand generation and take up of connectivity. So, what actually this means is that in our area, people didn't need, people th used to think that they didn't need internet connectivity. And once we got there, we created our community network, people saw uh, what uh, the internet has brought for them, then they started uh, asking for it, also, also by the incumbents. Uh, so this is, I think, a very clear um, example of how we function complementary to uh, the uh, service that is provided by uh, telecoms. Um, and uh, a second point is that I heard uh, excellent examples and uh, work that is being done with regulators all over the world uh, considering uh, um, training on what community networks are and how they work. I would love, I would really love to have a small video, like two, three or four minutes of all this work that is being done globally that I could use with our local regulators and show them that this is something really important that's uh, taking up uh, throughout the world. That would really help us uh, also promote uh, our case in Greece. Thank you. That's great, because I think that's something we could do <laughs> collectively. Okay, Don and then Ucha, and if we can go about a minute each, that'd be great. Thank you. My name is Don Means with the Gigabit Libraries Network out of California and the uh, Partnership for Public Access, p for pa.net. Uh, consortium of uh, ISOC, uh, 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 IEEE, uh, Eiffel, the library community, uh, looking at uh, uh, community networks, uh, public access centers like libraries, and offline internet as three approaches that should be able to reach anyone anywhere. Not the same, but interlocking uh, approaches. I, I want to respond quickly to uh, the, the, the policy issues that you mentioned earlier, Jane, uh, around uh, spectrum, universal service, and, and uh, uh, permits, which I can't speak to as well. That's a big variance on allowing these networks to operate. Uh, but for universal service, uh, there's, you know, it's a difficult area. It's much easier to collect this money than it is to spend it. Uh, uh, you know, in, in a way that actually accomplishes universal access, universal service. Uh, we would make the point that uh, uh, that connecting uh, institutions, community institutions, is an efficient way to spend money and actually provide access, proximate, at least proximate access to everyone, and that these uh, so-called anchor institutions can be a core network to build out from and to try to advocate for the government, the regulator, to, to assume this responsibility in fact rather than just rhetorically to uh, provide these kinds of resources. And that um, one of the cases that can be made for doing this besides supporting education and equity of access, which of course libraries stand for, is uh, access to public information, or e-government, we might say. Every government is spawning applications. Uh, who are these for? They're for people that are connected. 
Well, it's one thing for Amazon to provide services only to people that are connected, but it's a different thing for the public sector, for the government to only restrict uh, access, to restrict access to uh, government services to people connected. So they need an answer to that, and I think it's a way to apply a little pressure on the regulator and, and the government. Uh, on, on the spectrum side, uh, more spectrum, more open spectrum is better. I would just make the point that uh, all spectrum originates as the public airwaves. So it's a commons property originally. Through our vehicle of the government, the regulators, we then apportion it and assign it and license it for general benefit. A lot of that, most of that goes through commercial providers who in turn provide services. But some portion of that spectrum should be held for open use, public use, like Wi-Fi. Tremendous value that really wasn't predicted, but uh, in fact has changed the world. And that more spectrum should be set aside for public use. Uh, if we license it all off, it would be analogous to taking all the land and selling it off and then leasing it back, some back for a park, you know, in perpetuity. So public spectrum for, for public <laughs> access is, is another area I think you can make, make an argument. The last thing I would say is about the value of these networks to increase community resilience against disaster. We're looking at the increasing, of course, climate-driven events everywhere. Uh, fires are raging in California right now. The lights invariably go out. Having uh, a core network that is uh, designed for backup power is a way to add value to that and, uh, and, and make the case for more resources. Thank you. Thank you, Don, especially that whole issue with California and the fires. I know that the communities got cut off. Um, Ucha. Yeah, a minute. <laughs> Uh, legal question and thanks for uh, this uh, for, for everything, especially for the policy document. Uh, this person told about this. Just small uh, idea about we had quite interesting uh, point in legis European legislation about the community broadcasters because they had a different regime of regulations and quite different like mainstream broadcasters. But it's almost dying, so we can ask and we can take as a good practice because they don't have licensing. European Union has authorization and uh, easiest way to, because we need it to be, to compete with uh, big telcos and also small and medium uh, um, service providers. So I, can, I, I think that we can uh, take this uh, experience from society, from community radios and broadcasters and use it for community networks. Thanks. Thank you, Ucha, that's perfect. Um, so thank you very much, don't go, because there's a, an award ceremony from the Seed Alliance. Thank you very much, this has been extremely helpful. Um, APC, do you wanna have a closing, anything to say in closing? Just briefly, there has been questions in every single session about policy and regulation. Tomorrow at the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity at three in Sal C, at, uh, we will be discussing in depth guidelines for policy and regulation and community networks. Thank you. Excellent. Sorry, go ahead, Chad. Um, Sylvia, can we have the Dalai Lama to be the chief evangelist of uh, community networks? <laughs> Since it's been so successful. I mean, if Amazon can have a chief evangelist, we can have an evangelist as well, right? We can, we can put a word up for that. Uh, he blesses every piece of infrastructure that the Jaldi display de deploys. So maybe, <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so we're gonna turn it over to the Seed Alliance now. Thank you, but thank yeah. you for coming so, and yeah. thank you for participating. Thank you uh, so much, Jane, for, for the space to do this uh, brief ceremony. So in the past, uh, some of you who have been to other um, IGFs, we used to do more like a formal cer uh, award ceremony and um, this time around uh, we are hoping to do something um, a, a lot more informal. So um, we are essentially asking you to um, stay with us for an extra three minutes uh, to accompany us in introducing the Frida Community Networks Award winner for 2019. Um, the project that was selected um, this year is Nuestra Red from Colombia. Uh, Nuestra, Red, Nuestra Red is a project hosted by Fundación Vivir en la Finca. Um, and I would like to mention just three quick things about um, why they were selected for, selected for the award. 
Um, Nuestra Red is one of the oldest uh, community networks operating in Colombia, and, and the organization behind the project has been working for over 80 years, um, first on, on sort of the setup of local uh, communication uh, networks in rural Col Colombia, and later uh, in sort of bridge, uh, bringing, I should say, internet connectivity, um, specifically in the municipalities of Risaralda, Quindio, and uh, Valle del Cauca. Um, the other uh, highlight is that Nuestra Red has placed a lot of sort of emphasis on uh, local content and they really sort of thoroughly thought why it was that they wanted to uh, uh, sort of bring uh, connectivity to, to their community. Um, and um, the last thing that is, you know, worthwhile uh, highlighting is that their technical, technical team um, has uh, worked to sort of document different lessons around the setup of networks so that their solutions could be scaled elsewhere. And as a matter of fact, they have um, actually supported the setup of other community networks in Colombia. Um, I have been also asked um, uh, by colleagues from Nuestra Red to mention that back in 2014, they received the Chris Nichol Floss Award from APC. Um, which recognized initiatives that were making it sort of easy for, for, for people to start using open source software. And this award was the main driver that pushed them to sort of continue working on the development of Nuestra Red. Um, there's a lot more that, that I could say um, about them, but I know time is short. Um, so in representation um, of Nuestra Red, we have Freddy Rivera here with us. So Freddy, I will ask you to um, come forward. Um, and I invite you all to um, approach him at the end of the session if you want to learn more about the project and sort of hear more about um, Nuestra Red directly from him. And I'd like to also invite um, Esteban Lescano. Esteban is a member of the LACNIC board, which is the organization that hosts um, uh, the FRIDA program. And Esteban will, Esteban will be presenting the award to Nuestra Red. So please, guys, come, come up front. And there we go. I ask you for a quick round of applause for Nuestra Red and Freddy. Thank you so much. We'll do pictures afterwards. Thank you so much. Wow, that was great. Thank you, everyone. And as Carlos said, DC3 tomorrow. There's, and also there's a public libraries um, DC at the same time, so you have options. But thank you very much.
yeah. quickly because I haven't seen you. Oh no, uh, I, I know you've been busy, Jane. Yeah, Eleanor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Finally came to your session. Nice it's been really crazy the last two days because we were launching the contract for the web yeah, and, it's cool. and all that. So I, I, I didn't see you. I, I realized just. Your your event clashed with ours yesterday. What event? Uh, you, I saw. I think we had an evening event yesterday. That was the entire technical community. Oh. So that was the Internet Society. I can through the RARs. We always do it. On I don't know what. So we had ours the same time. So we realized so that we, we always do it on Tuesdays. So oh, we didn't need I don't to know how the advice went. Well, so even though we moved out to like six ask us because we've been doing it for the last five, ten years. I think every Tuesday. So we didn't mean to clash, but I guess we did. So what did you do? So yesterday we actually we did um, brought together all the partners and also what we contract.